So, everyone, we are going to start the last part of the of this first day of that council, the lightning talks. Uh, at each each speaker has ten minutes, all time included. We will continue till the end, and that is done for today. Thanks for attending. Hope we, we will enjoy the next days. Okay, so let's make this quick so we. Uh, can all call it a day. That's my uh, yearly what are we doing in RPM talk. Um, as you may have noticed, we've uh, pushed RPM 4.13 into Fedora last year, uh, which comes with a pretty long list of, new of changes, so I'm only going over the most uh, notably. One of them are file triggers. I don't know who has ever really heard of file triggers. Okay, it's pretty good. They're actually uh, already used in RPA in Fedora. Um, the next thing that's not so much used yet is uh, Boolean dependencies, which have just made it into uh, uh, RPM also. They are basically the extension of, of the weak dependencies we pushed in there last year. Um, there are people working on it, but it's not there yet. The third bigger new feature, which is as far as I know, not used anywhere already is support for uh, uh, security uh, IMA file attributes. That's basically support for trusted computing on the kernel level, file system level um, thing. So if you actually have started, have managed to boot into a trusted kernel, you can then make sure the kernel only reads files which are also trusted. So some uh, guy or actually Gal from, from IBM has been working on that. I don't know if anyone, anybody's actually interested to putting this into the real world, maybe IBM is. So if anyone in wants to have trusted computing in Fedora, we support it now, go for it. And in addition to these three big things, we have a huge number of smaller stuff I've only listed the stuff that's maybe more interesting for packagers or, or users. We've uh, added a remote path post uh, remove path post fixes, which is basically a setting which allows you to cut off the names of uh, file or files. This is uh, useful to create sub packages which have conflicting files in them. The problem is, as RPM has basically one tree of files which it packages into sub packages, it's not possible to have to file in multiple sub packages with different content. For example, having different uh, config files in sub packages that are pre configured for different use cases. And that's pretty annoying. And uh, I think Harald Hoyer has, and a couple of other guys have been nagging about this. So that's basically a, a band aid to allow this. So it's basically you, you give a, a, a postfix for the names, it is cut off and then you can basically use the remaining name uh, in, the, in the soap packages. Uh, then we have um, a new checks for the, uh, um, for the encoding of the spec file, something a lot of people have wanted to have for quite a while because there are still spec files out there which are not properly UTF-8 encoded. So and I think it's still disabled or it uh, just gives a warning right now. So I don't know. At some point, we are going to switch that to enforcing, and it will basically uh, prevent RPM build from building packages which are which have uh, non-proper encodings in them. Um, we also have uh, enabled uh, uh, the the, the process uh, expansion for the clobbing minor thing. Uh, but you can use it in, in the file list, for example. And we've extended RPM build with a new parameter, so you can do all build steps directly from an SRPM. So R for rebuild. Uh, you already could rebuild and source RPM directly, but you could only basically do a full rebuild and not build into the older stages that's supported now. Uh, we also added uh, what recommends and all the other queries for, for the weak dependencies, which we somehow missed last year when we added weak dependencies. Um, uh, yeah. How could you? I don't know. I, I must I, I, I 
must have looked elsewhere. Um, we also switched uh, the signing over to use uh, pin entry, more or less because pin entry is that you are no longer allowed to call us with the command line parameter. So now it's actually GPG that changed to no longer allow passing the password on the command line, and so we had to switch this over. That's done now. I hope there's no too many problems with that. I know that a couple of other distributions had issues with not having the proper version of GPG and pin entry lying around. We now run from unused macros, and there's a longer list of other stuff we fixed. Uh, there's a release note, so if you're interested. Okay, five minutes. Um, so then we've continued uh, with the development. The big uh, feature we're working on right now is, uh, is getting stabilized is the new uh, database format. Some of you might have seen it other day on the mailing list with a huge discussion. Problem is that there that the Berkeley DB we are using now has been bought up by Oracle and they ch changed the, uh, the license for the new version and there's all this politics involved and so we have to move away from that, basically. Another uh, thing that might be interesting, maybe not so much for Fedora, but for other people that are building uh, packages is uh, multi-threaded uh, accept compression. We have had some customers who had well set up continuous integration, which worked well by, by <coughs> compiling on like 64 processors, which was quick and fast until you have to compress the RPM, which is then single threaded and uh, takes a while if the package is big enough. So we have now a solution for this, and it's coming up in the next release. I think, I think it's only... It's currently, so far, as far as I know, it's no only compression. I think co decompression is, for one, fast enough. And on, the other, on the other hand, you need to read it sequentially anyway. So there's <coughs> not. <coughs> this might create problems with Delta RPMs, actually. <laughs> but I hope I have an intern that I can put on the task to check and make sure Delta RPMs will continue to work. There's all kind of tricky stuff like being able to actually reproduce the, the, el the delta bit or to recreate a package in a bit by bit uh, compatible way. Okay, uh, um, need to hurry up a bit. So there's a new uh, dependency generator written in for Python, written in Python, which comes in from the Mandriva crowd. Uh, there's been some discussion. It's not 100% finalized how it's going to be, but that's coming up. And there's a lot uh, of smaller fixes, so they're not going to be that much big, uh, uh, big changes, but more small bug fixes and all kind of cleanup. So we have basically uh, started to do a bug bug fixing Friday to get down with the number of bug of, of, of tickets we have in Fedora and on our own bug track tracker. Another interesting thing that we just added recently and backported to Fedora is we made missing OK, which used, used to be uh, basically config, missing OK, so you could have config files that are you allowed to delete without getting an error with, with uh, Verify. So we promoted missing OK to a full featured file, con uh, file attribute. The glibc people are currently needing this to get their uh, language uh, packages done, as they, for some reason, have files they want to merge in their language databases somehow, details to ask some Gigi people. So that's what we're doing right now. What else? We've moved, we actually not moved, but we have cloned our repository to GitHub. This has worked out very well for us, so we've, we are getting a lot of contributions right now. We are have even have to set aside a day a week to go over all the pull requests and get them merged and reviewed. Um, for now, a lot of these contributions are f outside from the Fedora world, so I want to urge you to have a look and make sure that not only the other distributions are actually pushing stuff in there with any without anyone else noticing or caring. So. Um, that's what's happening. There, 
How many minutes do I have left? One. Um, then. then I'm done. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, hello. I'm Honza Shilhan, and now we are moving one layer up from RPM to DNF. In my talk, I will cover what we have done uh, from previous year up until now, and also I will reveal some future plans for DNF. So DNF is, uh, DNF's main goal is still to maintain the compatibility with YAM. And so far we have YAM utils uh, almost fully compatible with uh, DNF plugins. So you can search for its counterpart via um, manual page uh, YAM to DNF. We have also added dimensions about DNF in Fedora project and Fedora wiki pages. So every, almost every use case is covered uh, in DNF snippet code as well. Uh, for those of you who are still using YAM, I have a good news for you. You can switch to DNF immediately. Uh, you can just type DNF migrate and it would transfer all your history and other metadata from YAM to DNF. The status of the packages relying on YAM, uh, there are only 13 packages. Uh, uh, no other, the rest of the packages were ported to DNF and in Fedora base image, there is no package which requires YAM. The tool FedUp, which takes care of a Fedora upgrade to the next version. It uses now DNF backend. That means that uh, you, it no longer ignores package conflicts and you could be able to boot up again. <laughs> okay, let's look at the new features that happened in DNF. We introduced new Mark command, uh, let's say you install package A, which requires package B. You install, uh, you actually uh, use two package, these two packages, and then you decide you want to remove package A. Then you not notice that package B is also getting uninstalled. To prevent this, you can type dnf mark install package B, and it will stay installed until you decide to remove it explicitly. Uh, DNF has full weak dependency support, so you can... I open the bug <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, so you can query in DNF repo query for it. It has minus minus suggest, enhances, supplements, and what enhances, and so on, switches. Uh, DNF also has two states, how it threads Big dependencies. By default, it installs all uh, recommended packages, but you can turn that behavior off if you want to keep your system minimal. You just have to uh, set to full install weak depths in DNF config option, in configuration file. 
I think I must say that DNF is more user friendly with regard to user experience. It provides you with some hints like that showing you that some packages were skipped and how to resolve some conflicts. We also, for package maintainers, describe the rules or uh, actually wrote the draft how they can prefer some package to another by using weak dependencies or version provides. Okay, now let's look to, for the plan to the next year. DNF so far is using four C libraries, while YAM was written entirely in Python. Recently, we have merged DNF C library with package kit library, and we are planning to move more parts from DNF to C code base. We would like to also, for package maintainers, describe some rules and provide them solutions with examples how they can resolve some packaging problems uh, with the use of cool stuff from RPM like Vite and rich dependencies. And the last thing, but not last thing, uh, we would like to DNF to actually provide more verbose output when you are dealing with some package conflicts and you want to know what happened inside the dependency solver. That's for the plans. Now I would like to invite you to the talk that's which has the title developers QEs of themselves. And as the title says, it's mainly targeted for upstream developers who has no QEs and would like to deliver stable releases of their application with minimal effort. So you are free, free to go there. Uh, we will explain our continuous integration workflow, which components we have used there. It will be on Sunday at 13.10. Do you have any questions? So you, can you skip the slide, quick slide? So uh, output variables dependency resolution, you're planning to make only on the, when something break on, can be this I do DNF upgrade and then let it output like DNF. Uh, no, no, only when there's conflict and transaction cannot be because, resolved. Because sometimes or there are no conflict, I would like to see why those packages are uh, chosen. Yeah, then you, can pick, then you can switch it on in verbose mode. Uh, it, it will be shown. didn't give me this uh, information. Yeah, that's the future plan. Any other questions? Uh, when you say document packaging, uh, is that appropriate to your package or where? Uh, it will be probably some draft, uh, packaging draft. You can actually use version from EPL 7, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah but, but there's yeah, only a version, I, th I think, 0 0.64. Any other questions? OK. Uh. When will the advisory switch to uh, install a specific update finally be implemented? Because this, uh, there is a request in Boxilla to, to implement this, but this still it has, it, and it was finally agreed by someone from the team, I don't know who it was, uh, that it should be implemented, but I, because it's not, but it looks like it's being actively worked on. And I think that that's really a big missing feature for people who want to test uh, individual updates from updates testing. Uh, and right now, th that's one reason why, why people still need to use YAM, because it's, uh, YAM, YAM supports this. Like you mean? Yeah. You, you give a specific update ID and... Excuse me, that's being covered by the work on security plugin, so yeah, it's being worked on. 
OK, any other questions? OK, thank you for your attention. Okay, I'm not going to talk uh, further up from DNF, but it is a completely different thing. Uh, I'm going to talk about release engineering. Um, uh, before I start my talk, I would like to show you this short clip, which always kind of makes me smile. One second, sorry. Yeah. So this is something when I hear release thing, I kind of remember this, <laughs> the crazy baby, which is kind of trained hard, and she is the one to catch that. So let me move on. Um, so why I'm a release engineer? Uh, it's thank you. Um, I come from the development background, and I also have an experience as release and configuration manager, and. I also worked in customer support. So what I realized uh, when I, um, while I handled all this role is I like solving customer problems. And I would like to uh, dive into the problem and technically see what is going wrong. And um, also, I was passionate about delivery and release processes. So that's when I kind of discovered release engineer is kind of a role which enables me to do all these things. So that's why I am here. And uh, so what do you have in store? As in, what is in store for you when you become a release engineer? What opportunities it opens? So from my experience, what I understand, um, being a release engineer at Red Hat, it has given me an opportunity to uh, develop tools which can be leveraged for the release, uh, faster release process. And um, you will get to work with a bunch of inspired people. And uh, you collaborate with teams, which is going to expand your knowledge about uh, the product or the project. Uh, so, And you will get a broader idea about how the product is going to be delivered to the customer, how can I mix it, make it accessible to the customer, and other parameters like quality and security of the product. So that's, that's, I think it opens up a lot of opportunities. And it can be at your capacity. You can grow in, uh, to further in any capacity uh, being a release engineer. You will work with multiple products. And you will with work with multiple teams. And uh, it will give you a thought about how um, the uh, processes that we have, how uh, we can leverage it across the products. So you will be thinking towards that. and. It's kind of a constant process. It is um, kind of reaching that maturity. And 
you will think of uh, innovative options of having different tools, how we can make the installation easy, packaging easy, and um, how, do, how to make the delivery process um, kind of uh, really streamlined and think in different ways. So it opens up uh, different opportunities for you. So what do release engineering do? So I would like to talk about my daily routine, how it looks like. So as a release engineer, um, broadly, if I categorize, your responsibilities would be uh, build and packaging and uh, content management and delivery into customer environments and also through the test environments where the developer wants to test it or the QE wants to test it. And um, this will, uh, uh, it also means that a uh, release engineer will be engaged starting from the planning phase of a product. So when any pro product or project is initiated, you will be contacted for uh, as a uh, person, uh, the go-to person to understand what are the contents I'm delivering, how I should be doing it, and uh, what are the different methods that are available, which distribution platforms I should be um, uh, looking for, things like this, and um, also ensuring uh, if the contents are accessible to the customer, how I can give them, how I can deliver it to the customer, and if they see any issue, how what is the process they should follow, uh, and uh, it's like really uh, being a release engineer, you will be evangelizing on the software develop, uh, delivery processes that are used, and you will be kind of a provide a consultancy to the products on how they can really um, go forward and um, when, once they deliver the products and how will it look like in the market and how the customer will see it. Um, say, for example, when you distribute it as a Docker image or ISOs or any other um, RPMs or anything, how are we going to kind of package it and uh, make it uh, reachable to the customer? So that's what we work with on that. And uh, uh, and on another note, uh, we uh, also develop tools. Uh, um, we kind of uh, keep a track of what are the different products that are coming in, what different methods they are using. Is our tool supporting those build environments, uh, test environments, and the test frameworks or mm, anything that they're following? Does our tool support it? Or do we need to come up with something new and support their processes and we think in all these uh, different ways and try to make the release as smooth as possible for them. So I think that's all I had to say and if anyone is interested in release engineering and to know more about it, you can contact me on this. So any questions? Yep. Um, actually, uh, we have a choice which product we would like to work on, and um, it's not like um, only one product. You might be interested to work on many, so it is up to you to choose. And it's not only uh, RPMs or anything that you can explore other options too. Yeah. Any other? So that's it. Okay, thank you. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Hello everyone, uh, my name is Nikolai Kondrashov. I work at Identity Management and Security Group at Red Hat. And I'm here to present about a project we are doing for a while now and what is going to happen and uh, 
what's exciting about it? And does it work? Does it work? I don't know. It is apparently. Ah, it must be in the other way. Yeah, thanks. That's better. Uh, so the idea is uh, that uh, many companies have, uh, especially big companies, have contractors and peripheral sysadmins uh, with which they don't uh, very have really big trust and which come in just for a while but need to access their privileged systems and have, uh, well, privileged access to some critical stuff. Uh, also, some government organizations, at least in U.S., uh, are required by law to present uh, recordings of user sessions for review. So, we are trying to build an open source system to handle that. There's plenty of uh, commercial systems. Uh, one of the bigger ones is Centrify, and there is plenty. I just, by uh, just looking on the internet, I found eight products which are more or less fulfilling that role and they are pretty good most of them they have centralized servers to store the recordings to search them to uh, play them back with various speeds and rewinding and look for comments which user entered at this point and just rewind to that point in the recording and like it's like magic uh, they are pretty good but on the open source side there's really nothing nothing good Really, not a product for that. There is sudo that allows to record user sessions, like the the privileged access into local files, but there is no way to deliver to the servers, like no built-in way. There is no integration with uh, uh, user management or anything. Uh, there are some tools that allow, like central recording, like uh, Teammate IO or Askinema or Show Term, where you can upload your session somewhere to a single place, but it's obviously not suitable for security purposes. So really, there is, uh, there is nothing that is fulfilling that role in open source world. And that, uh, that's where we come in. So uh, we are working on exactly the stuff that the uh, commercial solutions provide, but we are doing it the open source way. We are doing everything uh, from open source components and we are open source and everything, but we are doing extra. <coughs> and naturally, we are using the stuff that we have in our identity management team. So we are planning on using Free APA as the central management system and on the servers. And on the client side, we are using SSSD, which is going to control uh, session recording itself, configure everything and uh, control wh uh, who is recorded, how how he or she is recorded, etc. Uh, so everyone probably knows what Audit D is. It's uh, for those who doesn't know, it is a sy system that uh, gets some messages from the kernel and. Uh, records, uh, what user accessed what, and what syscalls were invoked, and uh, et cetera, et cetera, which we can use to record what comments the user executed, and uh, exactly what files were accessed, and uh, apply filters uh, to which files we want to track, et cetera. Uh, that's good, but there is really no good terminal recording solution, no program that is that allows to record uh, what user did on the terminal, what he, he saw on the terminal, what he typed in and what was displayed for him. <coughs> there is the, again, the script, the sudo, but they are not integrating well with central delivery. That's why we are implementing this thing. Uh, and I am the one implementing it right now. So, uh, it's a tool that basically gets in uh, in front of the user's shell, uh, records whatever passes between the shell and the user terminal, and logs that in JSON to wherever we want. So, uh, for example, there is a user session. 
uh, user trying to execute a command as sudo, and uh, below is what gets logged to uh, syslog at the moment. And uh, as <laughs> yeah, as shown as the and on the previous picture, eventually from the log server it gets to Elasticsearch, which would allow us to. Um, search everything to visualize everything and eventually dis display that in Kibana. And uh, our current idea is to get a playback visualization to get a nice playback with rewinding and everything in Kibana as, as good as possible. We have no idea if that's going to work, but we are going to try it. So back to that, this is how it would look in Kibana, uh, just, just viewing the JSON. So that's the same message. Uh, that's the same log message that we saw in the previous slide. And uh, the current plan is to get this to Fedora this year, later to release it uh, as tech preview in RHEL, and then get more of that. That's it. Any questions? Uh, the idea is to get uh, T-Log to run on the special user. Uh, it will be set to it, and uh, when user logs in, it becomes a different user, starts logging, then uh, forks, then drops back to the original user and starts the shell. So it runs on the different user. Of course, it doesn't help with root, but nothing helps against root. If we want to log root, uh, we will probably be using jump servers where the user will have to log into one server but he doesn't have the root privileges, then he logs into the, the target server and the intermediate session is logged. Screen? The thing is that you can stream that, and with tlog you can stream that. You can deliver these log messages mm -hmm. as they go. You just cut in pieces. There is time limit when they get logged, and that can get delivered immediately to Elasticsearch, where you can search it within five minutes. And that link below uh, has a video demo of how that happens, and there is a demo how that works basically. How does it handle Emacs? Yep. Then I run Emacs, and in Emacs I have few windows. So how it handles it? Uh, exactly how you see it on the screen. What you see on the screen gets logged. Uh, it's perfectly fine. It's all preserved and it's, yeah. Uh, yes, it's a problem. There will be an option to not log the user input, only the user output, but we'll still log uh, comments executed as part of audit D log. So we can just skip uh, input. We would really, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm out of time. We can talk personally. Okay. Thanks a lot.
That looks good. So it's uh, me between uh, you and the beer, so I'll try to do that quickly. Um, this is a motivation uh, a talk and a short how-to to do what uh, I'm trying to motivate you to, and uh, that is testing the kernel. So why help testing the kernel? There, there really, really is a lot of uh, computer hardware out there. Um, you know that uh, every year there's a new um, notebook and a su successor and printers get there out every new year. So <coughs> that's something the kernel needs to support. And uh, that gets even more complicated because hardware components can be com combined in zillion ways, uh, a zillion number of ways. Um, <coughs> and that influences uh, how Linux deals with it. Even what, it, what does, uh, does um, makes the situation even more bad is that firmware sometimes influences Linux compatibility too. And the <coughs> config you use in your kernel, or the, uh, the config that distro uses in your kernel, uh, influences it also. So in the end, most systems are quite unique, and maybe just in the stack that you have, there is something uh, where a bug shows up, and yeah, then that bug uh, is will show up and annoy you and others, and that uh, will happen um, even more quickly if you have really unique hardware. That's kind of if you're using a five or six year old graphics card nobody else uses anymore or, or was kind of special even back when it was new. So if you don't test that, <coughs> those new kernels um, on your hardware nobody might and uh, hardware uh, specific bugs might only be found uh, when they are really old. So maybe like uh, two or three months old, um, but depending on your distribution, can even be one or two years um, old. And uh, the problem with that is um, finding and fixing the root cause uh, of those bugs gets really, really harder y the older a bug gets. Uh, it sometimes can even get nearly impossible. If you have a kind of uh, six-year-old graphics cards and um, Maybe there was a bug in the driver, it didn't compile, and the kernel developer said, okay, here, um, the uh, code didn't compile for two years, it seems nobody used it anymore, then they throw it out. So if you switch from Ubuntu 14.04 uh, uh, to the next one that's coming out in April, uh, you suddenly might notice, oh, the driver that I used to use until now is gone. And yeah, then you bring it back is really hard, and then you are annoyed and you have to live with it and find a different solution. That's why you need to test. Uh, that's it's, it's in your own interest. Are there risks? Um, not too many old kernels get normally installed. They uh, stay installed when you're installing a new kernel. So you can always go back to the old kernel uh, and boot that instead. <coughs> and uh, new kernels normally are always backwards compatible. So um <coughs> And there shouldn't be any problems with the new kernel. Is there a risk of data loss? Um, it's quite unlikely. Um, that's a short version. Um, unlikely, s uh, on the other hand, says, yes, of course, it can happen. But it doesn't happen that often. So it's not something you should, um, it's, it's, it's something you should keep in mind. But it's uh, not a reason to not test, because otherwise nobody will test. And in the end, your hardware won't work anymore. So how to test? Uh, if you're a Fedora user, run Fedora Rawhide. Uh, the kernels used in Fedora Rawhide are um, pretty close to what Upstream is uh, developing right now in the mainline kernel. It's maybe uh, one, or the, uh, one or two days behind mainline kernel most of the time. Um, there are a few uh, Fedora-specific patches in the uh, Rawhide RPMs. Um, but it's uh, compared to other distributions that are just a few. So uh, if you report the problems um, to the Fedora developers or upstream, then it's normally not a problem that you uh, have a kernel that has ex extra patches in it. There are a few situations, but um, then the developers will tell you how to test it. If you're not running Rawhide because you think it's too unstable or uh, something like that, then you can also most of the time run the Rawhide kernel on the latest Fedora release. Uh, that works most of the time. I've heard that it right now doesn't work due to, to some dependency. Um, there are always <coughs> um, ways to get around it. But if it works, you can grab it uh, with DNF on the command line or from Koji directly and install the RPMs. It's quite easy. 
Um, as I indicated already, there are different ways. So there's a second way, and uh, that's actually why I'm giving the talk. Um, I'm maintaining a um, Fedora repository where I can got, uh, get vanilla kernel RPMs uh, and run them on Fedora without compiling them yourself. There's actually a page in the Fedora wiki that explains how to use it. Uh, two um, actually, the two important commands are uh, in the screenshot already. Um, I've, I've put them here as well, but you can't, can find them in the wiki. And if you're uh, Googling for kernel vanilla uh, repositories for Fedora, then uh, Google will, find you, uh, will get you there in case you forget to write down the URL. And yes, I'm running those kernels myself on my notebook to help testing the kernel. And I've never run into any bad bugs until now, but I've found a few bugs that I helped to debug and track down and suddenly get got fixed before they were hitting you and other Linux users. Um, similar re repositories like this one are available for other distributions, so uh, at least for the big ones. So if you want to go down that road, uh, just search for, for your distribution and vanilla kernels. Uh, the third way is simply doing it manually. Uh, that's quite easy. You download uh, and extract the latest kernel sources, uh, run these two commands. <coughs> that actually is a backslash there. What, well, whatever. Um, that creates a uh, configuration depending uh, uh, that's based on your old distribution kernel configuration, and then throws everything out that which, which is which seems to not be. Um, needed, so all the modules that are not loaded, basically, and then compiles this. Uh, on my ThinkPad, T420, uh, that's uh, like uh, four years old now, that takes just 12 minute, minutes, and then this kernel is ready. Uh, just running a install command, rebooting, and yeah, profit. And it's there, you can boot it, and uh, check if everything works, and if it doesn't, you can report bugs. That's the <coughs> main part. Um, I guess uh, time runs out soon. I have actually questions, like for example, how to get rid of those kernels again that w w didn't fit into the, uh, this talk. Normally, it's not a problem. RPMs you can 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 um, just deinstall, and the, and the kernels that you installed manually are quickly deleted from the file system. It's not that hard. Um <coughs> I'm putting them up here, but maybe you have questions already. For for the kernels I com compile myself, actually that that's on my to-do list. Um, but I all um, boot those kernels uh, once in a QMU and check if that comes up. Probably uh, normally I only publish them uh, if if they are booting, they're fine. The one, uh, where, where and how to report bugs? Yeah, I mean, if you're testing Fedora raw hardware, you can do it on the red hot shell store as well. You can also That depends on how specific the bug is. I mean, there are, as I said, zillions of hardware out there and combinations, and if it's something like an audio codec on your specific mas machine that likely nobody else has, then it's not that on, on at the top of the to-do list for the Fedora kernel developers. So you might be better off uh, um, getting the upstream there because uh, the developer of the driver knows more how to fix it and what might be wrong. Yeah, but not all, all the developers use it. That's also the short version. I could do this talk, I guess, in, in one hour, and there are still things to talk about.